Hi, I'm Tom Walski from Bentley Systems, and I'm here in my role as a member of the Water Distribution System Analysis Subcommittee of EWRI. And this is uh, part of the series where we interview some of the leading people in water distribution system analysis to, to find out about their involvement in water distribution system analysis. Uh, it's now the 24th of July at the WDSA CCWI conference in Kingston, Ontario. And I'm privileged to be able to interview Brian Carney from the University of Toronto. Uh, Brian got started at the University of British Columbia, and so we'll start uh, the interview from there. Uh, Brian, uh, what attracted you to water distribution system analysis? You were asking about background in water distribution system analysis, and uh, really it's an interesting story for me because I was convinced as a young person I wanted to be an oceanographer. I was fascinated with everything about the ocean and thought that that was the, the, the thing I would really be animated in my life. But in uh, my final year of high school, my parents moved to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and East Africa. And I went there specifically because of the interest in the Indian Ocean and the chance to uh, explore more of this oceanographic interests. Uh, but while I was there, I realized that there was a huge number of people who were spending a massive part of their waking existence doing nothing more than collecting and gathering water. Water supply, water distribution was a critically important issue. Most people were on intermittent water supplies. Many people, uh, we'd get up early in the morning and we'd see many people walking along the, the roads collecting water. And it really struck me as a Canadian, I'd always taken water for granted. Uh, and it was the time there that really made me realize water is crucial. Water brings life, water brings vitality, water brings um, the possibilities within cities. And so that was the, the germ that started to grow in terms of uh, an interest in water distribution. When I started university, I didn't know what to do still, but I ended up uh, sort of by default moving towards irrigation. Uh, and irrigation and, and water supply to crops really interested me for a while. But progressively, I got more and more interested in the water supply system and uh, the pumps and the, and, and the conveyance systems that were part of that. And I was offered a PhD with a, a lovely Estonian guy, uh, Eugene Roos, and he was an expert in uh, hydraulic transients, and so that's where that interest came. And uh, he suggested to me at one point that people had not done a lot on transients in water distribution systems. So that was the topic of my PhD. Right, and that's an important topic even to this date. Uh, so when you came out of school, uh, you went right into academia? Again, interesting the way uh, your life unfolds, not always the way you expect it to. Um, I, I graduated in 1984 uh, with my PhD and it was a terrible time in terms of employment in uh, the private sector. There had been a real recession in particularly in Western Canada, although much of uh, the Canada was in a bit of a depression. Many engineering firms had gone from 500 uh, employees to 50 employees almost overnight. And really I had two small kids at that point and had to make a practical decision of what I would do. I hunted around and ended up, um, much to my pleasure, being offered an academic position at University of Calgary, which was my first academic appointment. And um, I made a determination though that I would not be an ivory tower academic that I would engage and the city of Calgary was very resp uh, responsive and receptive to that so we immediately started doing a great deal of our developments in conjunction with a major city. That's, that's great that's really the way to do it. Uh, well you've seen a lot that since 1984 what kind of major changes have you seen in water distribution system and the way we analyze them? Well, I, the steady state analysis that was sort of growing out of Hardy Cross and then there was the various uh, more coupled methods that had gone on, that was really state of the art and PC computers were beginning to come on the scene. Um, the uh, desire or the interest of doing transient analysis was very awkward, very expensive. Uh, the, the people who had done it had really made a lot of money but they had turned off a lot of people of the value of doing that. But with the rapid explosion that took place in PCs, and I think 
sensors played a big role because as people started to listen to water systems, they started to realize that there was a huge amount of transient information and noise that was taking place all the time. And they had no idea of that. They had mostly had devices that had filtered that out. So transients went from being a uh, sort of a backroom uh, thing that you hardly ever talked about to something being much more mainstream. And at least within Canada over that period of time, it, it soon became mandated that you had to do transient analysis as you do, did things. So transients went from insignificant and irrelevant to far more central <clears throat> in the way people did it. Simultaneously with that, uh, there was a huge greater interest in the water quality transformations that were taking place. People being very blasé about uh, the system simply transmitted water that came from a water treatment plant. And so there was a, a, a more and more interest in water quality, which was actually a, a, spur, in, uh, a spur and an incentive towards greater engagement in the <clears throat> various issues of hydraulic control and, and, and transient analysis as well. So those things went together really well. Simultaneously with all that, with uh, improved databases came, of course, asset management. And the asset management, again, went from irrelevant to GIS-based with uh, significant investment in, in the inventory of, of what we had. So really, these things came of age, I think, very much over the time of my practicing career. It talked about water quality. You're in Ontario when Walkerton happened. Did Indeed. You get involved with that? Oh, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure I even want to be filmed on, on such a topic, but there was a number of us in Canada who really felt that Canada become very complacent and uh, about water quality issues and distribution systems. You know, we, we sort of felt we came from a country that had good water quality and lots of water and, and that you know, we were in a privileged position. And a bunch of us sat around at a conference um, uh, 20 years ago and, and sort of speculated saying that, that nothing will change until there's a disaster. And, and we didn't want a disaster, but we sensed that one would happen. We had no idea where or when. And when Walkerton happened, there was this huge sense of, oh no, this is terrible. But at the same time, there was a bit of a sense of, this is also an opportunity that you have a chance to, to wake up the, the field and, and get your life more in order. And one of the things that Ontario instituted at that, that point was a far better record keeping system and also the mandate of operators to be continuously trained. And we as uh, Hydrotech, the company that I'm associated with, we, we do a lot of training and it's a terrific way of opening the door for conversations. So Walkerton was a terrible disaster and, and one followed it in all sorts of ways, but uh, it was also like most crises, the worst thing about them is not to benefit from them and to use them as a kind of a jumping off point or a, or, or a, a sounding board in a sense for moving the conversation forward. Yeah, so it really changed the regulatory environment. Very much within Ontario. And I think Ontario went from being one of the most complacent to being more proactive, but again, you can sense that a uh, degree of complacency is settling in again. You know, we, we, we sort of put things in order and, 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 and I think that you know, we need another wake up call that these systems play a crucial role. One of my great frustrations, if I can interject for just a minute, about water distribution systems is so often we view the costs of these systems as though they were some sort of tax, as though they were some sort of um, weight that you have to carry that slows you down. You know, like wearing a, a handicap at a horse race or something of that kind. But, but we miss the opportunity that, that water systems create enormous opportunities for, for industries, for people, for people to live life. And I, I think that vision of infrastructure is something we have to recapture. This is not a tax. This is what facilitates human activity. Very good. Uh, for preparation for this uh, session, I went through your resume and it's very impressive. You've done about a gazillion papers. <laughs> so which, one, which work that you did would you consider to be like the most important it's almost like asking me which of my kids or grandkids I like the most. I, I mean, each of them sort of is something that you get connected with at the time that you're engaging. I, I think they sort of fall into categories, Tom, in terms of the, the possibilities or, or the, the background of these things. Initially, uh, my PhD work flowed into a variety of publications that dealt directly, directly with the generalizations needed to really think about transients in water systems. And really when you're thinking about transients, you're thinking about device behavior. So a lot of our initial work was to do with 
um, characterizing the way devices interact with the system or the way they, they generate change and the way that change propagates in the system. So the initial publications were in that area, and again, they, a lot of them related to water distribution systems in particular. But then we got very interested in a variety of other topics, and uh, some of the publications moved more into that larger picture of things like life cycle analysis, and um, a couple of our papers in that area were very interesting. Uh, with Andrew Colombo, we did some, I think, some very interesting work with respect to looking at demand and tying demand to climate related work, so that became very interesting. Most recently, we've done some uh, fascinating work with a physicist um, dealing with generalizations, universal scaling laws for water distribution systems, and I think that ability to stand back and look at the system as a whole and try to understand it is something that I'm very interested in. So I, I think, quite honestly, I'm really hoping I haven't written my most, um, you know, the, the paper I like the most yet. I think that, hope that's still to come. Okay, the best is yet to come, all right. Um, you spent time in New Zealand, uh, <laughs> a sabbatical, I assume. Uh, how, how did you uh, enjoy that? New Zealand is a totally fascinating place. Um, one of my former students, Mohammed Gudawi, has been in Hong Kong, and when I was in Hong Kong visiting Mohammed a couple of times, I became friends with uh, a very interesting guy named Mark Davidson, who was from, he was a Kiwi, he was from uh, Christchurch and went back to Christchurch. I ended up with an invitation to go there in 2004, and my wife and I have always loved hiking in the outdoors, and New Zealand's a, a mecca for um, outdoor activity. I got an opportunity to go there for six weeks and we fell in love with uh, Christchurch and then when they had the terrible earthquakes in 2010 and 11 um, I, I had a sabbatical coming up and I contacted them and said you know would a bit of outside connection be at all interesting or useful for you and so we went back for five months in 2012 and Christchurch was in a mess uh, the, the earthquakes and aftershocks were continuous during the time that we were there they you didn't they weren't all big enough that you could register but they were um, they were taking place at about five a day uh, through the whole five months that we were there and many of them you did experience and the city was in a bit of a a, a bit of a mess for that and we just wanted to bring a, uh, a connection with friends and with outside people and then I had, had an opportunity to go back just this last year for eight weeks and um, it, it was it was a marvelous time it was a time in Toronto I commute uh, an hour and a half each way each day in Christchurch I'm walking 10 minutes through gardens to to, to go to campus uh, it was it was was a lovely change from the, from life in Toronto. Um, so New Zealand is still a, a very special place. Pedro Lee is there. Uh, I think you might interview him in this series at one point. Pedro is a delightful guy to work with and uh, always always fun, always engaging. And a number of the other people I work with there are fabulous people. Uh, back to Toronto now, mm -hmm. though, in your hour and a half commute, I, I feel sorry for it. I would, I would never have that long ago. Well, but you, you have to learn to leverage that time. Yeah, I right. do a lot of reading. I set myself some ambitious reading goals while I, while I commute, and so the time isn't wasted. But uh, to me, I, I leave really early and come back either early or late, because the, the rush hour is just horrible now. It's just, you're like cattle in, uh, you know, in a herded tight yeah. context. So I assume you're reading audio books and you're not sitting there reading the newspaper or something. No, I read books, but usually not audio books. Okay. Yeah, usually so you take visual. A train or something I take the train. Oh, okay, so I think no. you're driving. With the no, 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 I, 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 I would go nuts if I had to drive. I, I commute. Okay. Um, getting, as I said, getting back to Toronto, though, you've also taken on a lot of administrative mm -hmm. responsibility in the school. How is that affecting your water distribution system work? Well, there's, there's. Clearly, um, a, a, a time limitation. Time is one of the most valuable assets that you ever have. Uh, and uh, but the administrative job I do is I, um, I I'm the associate dean of cross disciplinary programs. And what I do in that job is I create minors and certificates which the students take within their engineering program. And, and these minors and certificates are a way of leveraging their choices in electives. And, and by focusing their electives, they make better choices. So it's a kind of a nudge to give them some recognition for what, uh, what they should be doing more consciously, but they often do very arbitrarily. And we've created minors in engineering business and robotics and mechatronics and sustainable energy and uh, biomedical studies and a variety of different aspects. So at the moment, it, within Toronto, we graduate about 1,200 students a year. 
And of those, almost half of them graduate with one of the credentials from my office. And so this has been demanding in one sense, but also extremely rewarding and a lot of fun. And through that process, I've just met the most interesting people in the Faculty of Engineering, the ones who want to do something different. We just created a, a, a certificate and a minor in music with the Faculty of Music. So the students doing the minor actually have to do an audition. Uh, yeah, th th some of them are terrific performance uh, people and they work with music and then they study the technical side of music. And this is just so much fun. So it takes time, but it also animates my life and it's been a tremendously rewarding thing. A lot of administrative people do a lot of uh, boring committee work that's really uh, out of service to the university and I have tremendous admiration for them. I am incredibly lucky because the administrative job is mostly fun and very little administrivia. Great, that's what I like to hear. Okay, well, we've talked about you know your your history leading up to now. So where are we going then? Now, we usually end these interviews with a, a, a view to the future. So what do you see is going to be different? Like ten years from now, if we have this interview. What will you change? Well, I, I certainly hope that we progressively get better at attending the way systems are actually performing and actually listening to them. Uh, you know, in the past we've we've been preoccupied, I think, with the the problem of solving new system. Problems problems in the sense that we've done a lot of work with you know how you do optimally design or, or multi-objective design of a new system or a new setup as though we're doing that more and more of our infrastructure is actually built and and many of uh, many of those pieces are decaying or the components are, are are performing more and more poorly I think we need a real vision that, that takes into account what these systems are really doing and listens to them. So it's sensing uh, computer analysis, but not so much the traditional problems of, of looking at building a lot of new stuff, but of, of making use of what we have. I think this overall concept of system health has to become critical. The health from the point of view of the people that use the system, but, but the health of the system as a living, breathing, dynamic entity that has everything from heart attack equivalents of, uh, of, of rapid events and, and, and sudden changes to long-term chronic problems of, of you know, uh, leakages, the equivalent of bleeding. So I, I think we need that overall vision. The other thing I think that is, is crucial is, is to recognize the interactions between infrastructure systems. When you build a water system, you're not just using arbitrary land. You're, you're using a conveyance system that's under road. Uh, inspection is difficult, uh, getting access to that. So this whole rapid development in various trenchless technology uh, techniques for both inspection and for repair, I think those things have a terrific future. Um, I, if I were younger, I think I'd look into those things in a great deal more detail. But the reality is I plan to retire in a few years. Being a grandparent is, uh, is much fun or more fun than it ever was to be a PhD supervisor. So. Wonderful. Well, when I, when I had the opportunity to interview you, I was looking forward to it because I knew you'd be good and you lived up to my expectations. Oh, and, thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you for coming in and being part of our project. Uh, we'll, uh, Look forward to posting your uh, interview and hopefully you'll get a lot of folks looking at it. Well, thank you for this marvelous opportunity and, and the people like yourself and Walter who have a vision of collecting the history, of having a sense of where we've been and where we're going. I, I applaud your work enormously. I think this is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.